Hi folks, I'm Tanvi Kapoor and a warm welcome from Inmobi. We have a mixed bag today in terms of audience with people joining in from around the globe. So good morning, good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Let's start with the topic of discussion today, measuring mobile video ads. We have started the last quarter of 2016 and every quarter so far has exhibited signs of increased spending on mobile video advertisements. In fact, eMarketer predicts that spending on the format will grow by 20% or more through 2017. It is quite intuitive why mobile video ads are such a big hit with advertisers. The video format helps increase brand awareness through simple storytelling, while the mobile medium allows them to reach a targeted audience most effectively to increase favorability of their brand. Yet, even amidst all this heightened interest and spending on mobile video, many brand professionals readily admit that challenges remain. Short attention spans on mobile and more importantly, concerns around the viewability of mobile video ads on small screens are major issues when thinking about mobile video. With this as a background, it is but obvious that advertisers need to be able to measure each and every aspect of their mobile video ad spend from performance to effectiveness to pricing to really understand if they're getting the right ROI from their advertising spends. In today's session, my colleague Abhishek Khurana, who leads product marketing for performance solutions, and myself, Tanvi, uh, who leads product marketing for brand solutions, are actually going to walk you through some of the most basic and most important metrics that every advertiser should definitely measure and know about. We'll cover the mobile video ad journey, different video formats, the most important performance metrics, different forms of attribution, different pricing options, and finally, viewability. During the course of the webinar, we will also cover industry benchmarks for the different metrics and basic best practices to optimize them. In light of the recent controversy created by Facebook misreporting video views, it is very important that advertisers understand the different stages involved in the serving and rendering of a video ad impression. As seamless as it seems, Getting a video to play on the mobile device and extracting ROI from it in terms of either video completes or conversions is actually a laborious 12-step process. It starts with the ad request, of course. This ad request may be sent by the publisher at the time of app launch or just before the ad is to be shown. Most ad networks advise publishers to send the ad request at least a few seconds before the ad is to be shown. To give, uh, to give adequate time for the video ad asset to be loaded on the device. Unlike banner ad assets, which may be as light as 10 KB, video ad assets range from 2 MB to 10 MB. Now, once the ad network registers the ad request, it will serve the ad. This just means that the network's ad server has sent a video ad response from its side. It does not mean that the ad has reached the mobile device or been loaded. Once the ad response reaches the device, it is considered as loaded. This itself has multiple steps involved. For example, if it's a WAS tag, it involves unwrapping the WAS tag and extracting the actual video asset, which may be an MP4 file. Most WAS tags have multiple wrappers around the MP4 file for measurement or targeting purposes, and each wrapper adds to the loading time and hence exchanges on networks might actually restrict the number of wrappers which are allowed in a WAS tag. When the publisher wants to display the video ad on the mobile device, they will give a render command. Depending on how the previous step of loading the video asset went, it may be successful or unsuccessful. Either the SDK, uh, the ad network SDK, or the publisher will return an error to indicate that the ad could not be played or it will open the native video player or a web view to render the ad. This is literally an intent by the publisher or the ad network to show the ad. The next step is actually playing the ad. Um, I'm sure you might have come across instances where, where instead of the video playing, you see the processing circular icon on a blank screen. It implies that the video asset is still loading. This is another point of drop off. Once the video starts, it is counted as a video play. A good ad network will not allow the video ad to be rendered and played until the entire asset has been loaded completely in order to avoid a bad user experience. 
For networks which bill on video views, this is the point when the video ad is actually billed to the advertiser. All right, next we come to the most contentious point in the ad process, uh, which has risen to fame recently, that is viewability. There are multiple definitions of viewability and we will go over them later in the webinar session. But to keep it simple, let's go with the Media Rating Council's definition. The mobile video ad is considered viewable when 50% or more of the pixels are in view for at least two continuous seconds. In case of an in-feed ad or a mobile video ad, where the user has the option of scrolling up or down the page, think Facebook video, the 50% pixel requirement makes good sense. Because of course you want the user is at least able to see the ad on the screen. In case of in-stream placements or interstitial placements, 100% of the video ad pixels will always be on the screen. The two second requirement is to ensure that the advertiser is only paying for video views where the user had an intent to watch and didn't just close or skip the ad immediately. Now, as the video progresses, it will mark different quartiles as complete. When 25% of the video has completed, it is considered as quartile one or Q1 complete. Similarly, when 50% of the video has been completed, it is Q2 complete, Q3 at 75%, and finally, Q4 or video complete at 100%. Some networks also offer CPCV, which is cost per completed view billing, in, case, uh, in which case the advertiser is only billed for those impressions which resulted in a completed view. If you're a brand advertiser looking for brand awareness, then these are the metrics that you worry about. On the other hand, if you are a performance advertiser or looking for engagement, then there are two more metrics that keep you awake at night. These are the CTR and the CVR, which are driven by clicks and conversions. Depending on the video experience, the user may be given a call to action through an ephemeral button throughout the video or on an end card after the video completes or is skipped. If the user clicks on this, it will contribute towards the click-through rate of the video. Once the user clicks, uh, they are then taken to the advertiser's landing page where they may be required to do further action like filling out a form, installing an app, or simply perusing the web page. For performance advertisers, the KPI is not video completes, but how many unique users actually convert and complete this last action. Depending on the type of attribution mechanism in place, the success may be measured of users who converted after a click or came back later to complete the action. My colleague Abhishek Khurana will walk you through the different types of attribution and what works for different types of advertisers later in the session. So that, to summarize, is the life cycle of a video ad. If you have any questions, please feel free to shoot them over and we'll answer them at the end of the session. All right, next we come to the different formats of video ads. Uh, please bear in mind that by formats, I do not mean the different experiences which are available in terms of templates or placements. This is purely about the different formats which advertisers can use to distribute or ingest the video ad. So the most popular video ad formats on mobile are VAST, VPAID, MRAID, and Site Served. We will deep dive into VAST, VPAID, and MRAID in the next slide. Site served is basically when the advertiser or agency gives the video asset in the form of an MP4 or MOV file directly to the ad network. Site served implies there is no third party involved which is hosting, serving, or measuring the video ad. This does not mean that there is no measurement available for a site served ad. It just means that the ad network or the publisher is going to provide those measurements. There's no independent third party which is going to provide these measurements. Let's deep dive into the different third-party video ad formats now. As an advertiser, if you're spending on mobile programmatic channels, there is a 95% chance you're using one of these formats. On the other hand, if you're working directly with an ad network, then you're probably leveraging MRate or site served. Let's start with the VAST format, which stands for Video Ad Serving Template. It was initially launched in 2008 and is a standard for the video player, allowing advertisers to structure the tag or URL in such a way as to communicate important details about how the video is to be played to compliant video players. 
Now, before Vast, every different video player had different requirements for the video ad creative. And consequently, advertisers were spending a lot of time and resources in creating different versions of the same video ad for each video player. IAB came up with the Vast template to standardize the communication between video players on the one hand and ad servers on the other hand. For example, the template specifies uh, metadata about how long the video should be played, what metrics to measure, whether it is to be skippable or non-skippable. The video may or may not contain a companion ad, which is uh, generally rendered as an end card on mobile. For those of you who are not aware, a companion ad is a static creative, which is used to provide supplementary information along with the video creative. Now, Vast was great for scale, but it lacked interactivity. Advertisers who were interested in engagement found Vast to be a passive format. Hence, VPAID was born. VPAID stands for Video Player Ad Interface de uh, Definition and provides a framework for facilitating interactions between the video player and the ad unit, which is focused on enabling a rich interactive experience. An example of a VPAID enabled interaction would be that a user could click on a video ad to view more detailed content, such as a longer version of the video ad, or just a learn more button, which allows them to see more text or engage with the, with the area around the video ad. VPAID was originally designed for desktop and hence primarily used flash technology for the interactive functions such as overlays and clicks. It then started being used on mobile web as well. However, now that Flash is dying with applications like Chrome no longer supporting it, VPAID will also have to move to HTML5 or JavaScript. VPAID has been gaining popularity amongst uh, brand advertisers at, as it allows them to measure viewability metrics, which was so far missing in Vast. Vast 4.0, the latest version, um, is making attempts in this direction, uh, that is in terms of viewability measurement, but until it gets adoption, Advertisers seem to have moved to VPAID to be able to measure the plays, pauses, and audio settings of their mobile video ads. And lastly, we come to Emirate. Emirate stands for Mobile Rich Media Ad Interface Definition and is basically an API for facilitating interactions for a rich interactive creative within a mobile in-app environment. I think it is important to keep in mind that Emirate is meant for rich media ad creatives, which may or may not contain video. However, as the popularity of video ads rises and people want more interactive videos, we have observed that advertisers tend to fall back on M-rate video ads when they want to combine the power of emotive storytelling with rich engagement features. M-rate was designed specifically for mobile apps and unlike Vast and VPAID, it does not have standardized measurements for the important video metrics like quartile completions. However, M-rate is flexible enough to measure anything through custom beacons. Uh, but it's just that the advertiser won't be able to compare the performance across platforms. So I hope you understand the difference between Vast, VPAID, and Emirate now. We will, uh, let's deep dive into the performance metrics. First up, we have scale. If there are two things that advertisers care about, it is scale and ROI. While the ROI might vary across different types of advertisers in terms of video completes or uh, conversions, there is no mistaking what scale is. Advertisers care about how many people saw their marketing message and at what frequency. To actually assess how many distinct users or mobile device IDs were reached, you should be looking for unique views instead of total views. This is purely a function of the scale of the network or publisher or exchange. For instance, InMobi has a scale of 1.5 billion device IDs. You should try to learn what is the DAU and MAU reach of your supply source to ascertain how many people you will be able to reach during your specific campaign period. Obviously, as you add on different targeting layers, the scale will shrink. Overall, the industry generally faces a shortage of high-performing mobile video inventory, so it is not uncommon for advertisers to ease up on their targeting cuts in order to reach as many people as possible. The trade-off between spillage and scale is unavoidable. All right, let's assume that the video was played. For brand advertisers, the most important KPI for measuring the performance of the video is completion rate. 
Advertisers may also measure the different quartile completions along the way, which is calculated as number of views that completed the specific quartile, that is 25% or 50% or 75% of the video, divided by the total number of views. So why is this important? Quartile completions and completion rate tell you exactly how much of the marketing message is being conveyed to the user. Quite a few ad networks, in Mobi included, ensure that the skip or close button doesn't appear until after Q1 complete. This ensures that at least 25% of the message is conveyed to the user. We call this delayed skip videos. Of course, the country's advertising laws have to allow this. For example, in China, every digital advertisement must necessarily feature the close button right from the beginning. So delayed skip videos are not possible in China. Completions along the way, which is calculated as number of views uh, that completed the specific quartile, that is 25% or 50% or 75%, divided by the total number of views. So why is this important? Quartile completions and completion rate tell you exactly how much of the marketing message is being conveyed to the user. Quite a few ad networks, Mobi included, ensure that the skip or close button on the video ad doesn't appear until after Q1 complete. This ensures that at least 25% of the message is conveyed to the user. We call this uh, delayed skip video. Of course, the country's advertising laws have to allow this. For example, uh, China has recently changed its ad uh, digital advertising laws to uh, mandate the close button right from the beginning. So delayed skip videos will not work in China. So let's look at how the quartile completion rates look on average. I have numbers here from the Mobile Marketing Association for mobile video advertisements which were run in the US across multiple partners. I also have numbers from Facebook video ads, uh, but the numbers from Facebook include both desktop and mobile. And then there are also numbers from InMobi, which is obviously just mobile. As you can see, uh, since we have a delayed skip, our Q1 completion rates are nearly 90% and then uh, drop as you go further. These uh, numbers are uh, from InMobi are a blend of skippable and non-skippable. Uh, if you're talking about uh, non-skippable uh, video ads, we've seen completion rates of 85 to 90 percent. And uh, for skippable uh, video ads, we have seen completion rates of uh, 50, 55 percent. Yeah. So what can advertisers do to influence the completion rate? Turns out there are quite a few user patterns to keep in mind as well as messaging actions that can be implemented to improve upon the completion rate. First off, the length of the video. This is a no-brainer. It's interesting to note that in several tests done to see how completion rate varies by video length, it was found that extremely short video ads have lower completion rates. I guess that's because the video length is too short to convey anything meaningful, causing the user to skip as soon as possible. It has been found that 15 seconds is the sweet spot for mo uh, mobile video ads for maximizing on this metric. Next up, the video ad content itself. As you know, a lot of mobile video ads are played with sound or so as not to create an intrusive or jarring experience for the user. So we encourage advertisers to build mobile video ads which will be equally effective uh, should there be no audio. This can be done through subtitles or building an emotional connect in the first 25% of the video ad itself. Third, if your KPI is completion rate, then explore the different publisher placements available. Obviously, a non-skippable video works out in your favor. You might want to try out user opt-in videos or rewarded videos, which are non-skippable placements, and yet have the user's explicit buy-in, so as not to create a negative association with your brand. The fourth is an operational detail in terms of the time of day of targeting. Target your audience when they're most likely to view mobile video ads. In general, a majority of the people tend to use their mobiles for entertainment purposes during the early morning or late evening commute. This will in fact vary for different audience segments. For instance, we have observed that moms as an audience segment tend to see more mobile video ads during the afternoon probably when the kids are off to school and they have some free time at their hands. The graph that you see over here shows how completion rates uh, vary across uh, uh, each hour of the day. You will see that they are 
highest right at the beginning up until say 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock and then uh, rise again post 10 p.m. in the evening. And finally, are you thinking about mobile uh, video ads from a mobile first lens? Leveraging mobile first video formats such as vertical video ensures that you're adapting your message to the user's preferred device orientation, which is portrait. 99% of mobile devices are designed to use in the portrait mode. The days of the Nokia Engage and the Engage QD are long gone. And it's time advertisers realize that a one size fits all approach will only get you mediocre results. On the next slide, I actually have an example of how the video ad experience will vary between a 16 by 9 landscape video versus a vertical video. You can see that instead of occupying just 25% of the screen, a vertical video occupies 100% of the screen when in the portrait mode and is hence more effective in delivering your market message, marketing message. All right. Let's discuss the metric which has risen to fame since Facebook admitted its reporting error, the average viewing time of a video. First off, why is this metric important? In fact, this is a metric which isn't, which, or at least until recently, wasn't measured by most independent third-party uh, providers. And uh, Facebook was self-reporting this metric. It tells ad advertisers what is the average length of the video that is being viewed and how much time they have to convey their brand message to the user. Advertisers also use this metric to decide what content is working and what is not. So how is it calculated? Simply by dividing the total viewing time of a video ad by the total number of views of the ad, no matter how short or long those views were. So what exactly happened with Facebook? Now suppose there are 100 views of a video. Just remember these numbers uh, broadly. 100 views of a video. This is 100 views of any length of the video. Some of the views could have been 2 seconds, some for 5 seconds, some for 15 seconds, and uh, some for the entire duration of the video at, say, 30 seconds. Suppose the cumulative viewing time of all these views is 1,200 seconds, which means 100 views, 1,200 seconds of viewing time. Now, the average viewing time is then calculated as 1200 by 100, which is 12 seconds. But what was Facebook doing? Facebook was not counting video views correctly. They counted only those views which crossed the three second mark, which industry benchmarks tell, uh, tell us is about 50% of the total views. So instead of counting their video, uh, video views as 100, they were actually counting 50. And as a result, the average viewing time was 1200 by 50, which is 24 seconds, double of what the average viewing time actually was. There is a huge uproar because advertisers have taken decisions on content and what platform to spend on based on this metric. So it's important for you to know how to calculate it correctly. I will now hand over uh, the audio controls to my colleague Abhishek, who's going to talk about the other performance metrics which matter to advertisers. Over to you, Karana. Thanks, Sandeep. So uh, let's talk about another fundamental unit of measurement, which is the click-through rate. To put it simply, click-through rate or CTR is defined as the ratio of the number of clicks to the number of impressions. It's a great metric to measure for particularly advertisers who have a call to action or a CTA in their ad campaigns. For app install advertisers, this translates into the download now button. And for brand advertisers, this could mean a sign up or a register button or so on. A click in such campaigns is a signal of intent which ad networks can leverage for optimization of, the, of your campaigns. An important note here for a marketer, it's not wise to compare ad success across different media channels using CTRs. However, comparing CTRs for the same media type will give an indication of which creative message is encouraging the most clicks for the audience of traffic it's being displayed to. I hope that's clear. Uh, let's just dive into the factors that can influence the click-through rate. <clears throat> the first most important factor, content. The content being displayed to the user must be engaging and compelling enough 
for the user to express his interest by clicking on the ad. Depending on the ad format, whether it was a splash video ad or a skippable or a non-skippable video, do ensure that you create variations of your video ad to cater to the desired length. For example, splash video ads should not last for more than 5 seconds, while non-skippable should ideally be between you know, 10 to 15 seconds and so on. <clears throat> Secondly, the device of the end user does affect the CTR rate. At Inmobi, we've seen a stark variation in CTRs by device type. In the corresponding graph that you that is displayed here, we can see a significant difference in CTRs between devices. That is between uh, the iPhone 6 Plus to the Moto G to the I iPad. All this could be due to a combination of factors such as the processing power of the device or the screen size and so on. Thirdly, this is the classic time of the day or the day of the week variation. Intuitively, it does make sense that CTRs may vary depending on the day of the week or the time of the day. The data here was analyzed for the US market and daily CTRs were averaged over the last six months. Looks like Sunday has the highest CTR most likely since people do have a lot more spare time and are more receptive to advertising on a holiday. Understandably, the CTR does drop when the Monday's blue kick in and more or less continues its downward trend till Thursday and then again starts to rise on Friday back through Sunday. Understanding these variations is, is essential so that you can factor it in in your decision making while planning your campaign budget allocation. The last point, another important factor here that has a profound effect on CTRs is the type of end card for your video ad. Typically, your advertising partner or network has end cards built into the various video formats. On a high level, there are pretty much of three types. There are videos without end cards, which are mostly pre-roll, mid-roll, or post-roll videos a la YouTube that occur in the beginning or in between or at the end of the video content that is being consumed by the end user. Then there are videos with static end cards. <clears throat> You see several app install advertisers who advertise using this template. The end card delivers additional information to the end user, such as the app rating, the number of views, etc. Also, the install now button color may, may change from country to country as well, depending on how it performs. You as an advertiser do not need to worry about the end card. Your advertising partner should have productized these end cards where, wherein you just have to upload the video and depending on the country and OS operating system from where the ad request originated, the corresponding end card will be stitched and shown once the video play completes. These videos with static end cards are twice as effective as videos without end cards from a CTR perspective. And these numbers are uh, you know, what we've analyzed on Inmobi as a network. The third type of end cards, these are videos with interactive end cards. These end cards, as the name suggests, are interactive. Using Embrate guidelines, for example, these end cards can respond to users tilting the phone, shaking it, blowing into it, and can be customized to showcase additional information. In this example, the end card shows tiny windows for additional trainers, trailers for narcos. You can even customize this creative for, you know, the quote-unquote white powder to rise up and fall like snowflakes when you blow into the phone. These end cards do require a bit of manual effort in creating, uh, but the performance of it makes it all worthwhile. They're twice as effective as videos with static end cards and four times as effective as videos without end cards. So after a click comes a conversion. So now let's look at conversion rate as a performance metric. Conversion rate or CVR is defined as the ratio of the number of conversions to the number of clicks. A conversion event means completing the call to action that exists in your campaign. For app install advertisers, this could mean installing the app. For e-commerce advertisers, this could mean purchasing a product. Or for a non-gaming app, it could be completing a sign-up or a registration for or a registration. And uh, you know, for a taxi app, it could mean like taking the first ride. That could be uh, counted as a conversion. 
there are several factors that impact CVRs, the most basic of which is the audience piece being targeted. Showcasing the right proposition to the right user is the best way to maximize CVRs. A tip here, you can experiment with different audiences by spending small amounts uh, of your campaign budget on targeting these different audience segments and then analyzing which segments actually deliver, delivers the highest CVRs. Once you've narrowed down on specific audience segments that give you good CVRs, you can go ahead and scale your budgets and spend on these segments with your various advertising partners or networks. Next, you would want your ad campaigns to influence the maximum number of users, which means that the construct of frequency capping and pacing needs to apply to your campaigns so that you don't bombard the same user multiple times, thereby wasting impressions, which may end up resulting in bad CVRs, while at the same time, this could even exhaust your budget. By working with your advertising partner, ensure that they have frequency capping and pacing constructs in place to deliver the maximum impact per impression for the end user. And finally, setting the right attribution configuration can do wonders for your campaign CVR metrics. Let's learn more about attribution. But first, let's just understand broadly how attribution actually works. As you can see here, let's say a user is using an app that has requested for an ad that is shown to the end user. Now when the user clicks on the ad, a notification is sent to the ad network and the tracking partner server as well, notifying them that a click has actually happened. In this notification, the impression ID, device ID, and certain metadata is logged in the servers. In the meanwhile, to the end user, this click will redirect him to the app store where he can go ahead and download the app. Once he downloads the app and then launches the app, another notification is generated from the app which contains the device ID and metadata. And this is sent to the tracking partner server, which in turn checks to see if an impression ID exists, which is corresponding to the device ID that was sent earlier. And if it does, Great, a conversion event is logged against this advertising partner and the advertising partner is notified of this conversion. Pretty straightforward here. So I hope that you've understood on a high level how mobile attribution actually works. And uh, we can use this to understand some of the factors that can really help optimize the CVRs of your campaigns. Okay, so traditionally, a lot of trackers and advertising partners use a synchronous flow for attribution that introduces flow post-click latency in the conversion funnel, which ends up resulting in drop-offs and a suboptimal user experience. What this actually means is, when a user actually goes, a, goes a, and clicks on a particular ad that he sees in the app, a browser window opens up for just probably a microsecond, which loads up the tracking partner's URL, and then this redirects to the corresponding app on the store. This entire process hampers the user experience, as you can see in this particular example. And this can end up resulting in a uh, you know, significant amount of drop-offs. A solution to this problem is using the asynchronous flow for attribution that works via a server-to-server -server connection between the advertising partner and the tracking partner. This helps in reducing post-click latencies. So S2S actually means that when the user clicks on, clicks on a particular ad, the advertising partner server fires a click ping to the integrated tracking partner. And this prevents that additional flash of the browser opening prior to the app opening on the store, thereby minimizing user drop-offs. Typically, we see uh, probably about 15 to 25% improvement with async mode turned on. And we recommend that you work with your tracking partner and advertising partner to ensure that asynchronous flow through a server-to-server -server connection is supported and enabled for your campaigns in order to get the best results possible. And other important factor here, turning on view through attribution is another important nuance when it comes to attribution, as it does help in improving the absolute number of conversions for your campaigns. For the purpose of this example, 
Let's assume that you drove 8,000 installs. The click base installs were about 3,000, which means that the remaining 5,000 installs may have been organic. However, not everyone who looks at an ad showcases his or her interest by clicking on it. The user may be a non-clicker, that is somebody who hasn't clicked on an ad in the last 30 days. However, he still may be influenced by the ad and may proceed to download the app being advertised at, at a later point in, in the day. Such a technique of attribution where a conversion is attributed to a user who has viewed but not clicked on the ad is called view through attribution. Various media companies have conducted research that has shown that by just viewing an ad, a user is much more likely to convert than a user who has not viewed the ad. According to Yahoo Research, this user intent searches, surges by 155% post viewing an ad. Even on the Inmobi network, we have seen that post impression, the user conversions shot up by a staggering 60%. View through attribution allows you to factor in the non-clickers, which allows for your advertising partner to optimize on acquiring more of these users, thereby getting you more scale. Ensure that you turn on view through attribution for your campaigns by consulting with your advertising partner and tracking partner in order to maximize your conversions. And finally, attribution windows. Nowadays, it's fairly common for users to download the app being promoted a couple of hours to a few days after, that, after they viewed or clicked on the ad. This is probably because they do not want to download the app while on mobile data or roaming and are actually waiting to connect to a Wi-Fi access point before downloading it. Maybe the battery is low and they want to charge their phone before downloading the app as well, which is why uh, you know, they may be just uh, downloading it a little bit later. So an attribution window is defined as the time period before the conversion that the tracking partner must look back to in order to find an impression that actually caused this conversion. For view through attribution, we found that 75% 70, 70 of all view based installs occurred within 48 hours of the impression being served. Hence we recommend that you set two days as the attribution window for view through attribution. Similarly, we found that for click-through attribution, that the ideal attribution video, uh, sorry, the ideal attribution window is seven days, uh, as 80% of CTA installs happen within the seven-day period. And to wrap up attribution, keep in mind, set optimal attribution windows, turn on VTA, and ensure that asynchronous flow via server-to-server -server integration with the tracking partner is supported and enabled. Let's move on to the different pricing models uh, that the advertising partners offer for videos. CPM or cost per mill is a pay structure designed to generate brand awareness. The advertiser pays the publisher for every thousand times that the advertisement is displayed to a, to a consumer. This CPM pricing model is all about massive scalability. With the cost of media, a steady constant regardless of performance, the opportunity for high ROI presents itself. CPM is particularly effective when you have high performing creatives as the cost of each action will go down as the total number of actions taken goes up. This is one of the main reasons why the CPM model synchronizes quite ably with mobile advertising. In short, the better your campaign performs, the, the more bang for your buck. Now, there are several different interpretations of CPM billing in the industry. Several advertising partners consider one impression as one video play and hence charge a CPM as a cost of 1,000 video plays. The Media Rating Council or MRC on the other hand cons considers a video as viewed if it has played continuously for at least two seconds. Hence, this type of viewable CPM billing is another standard practice that is being used. Similarly, Facebook considers a video as viewed if it has played for at least three seconds and charges a CPM based on its, defi on its definition of a view. YouTube, due to, due to the nature of its pre-mid-roll video offerings, 
considers a video as viewed if it has played for at least 30 seconds or the entire length of the video ad, whichever comes first. You may have also heard of the most commonly used pricing model known as the cost per completed view or CPCV, which is pretty much just another variation of this of these models that I have spoken so far. It considers a video as an ad as viewed if it has been watched entirely to completion and charges the advertiser for each completed view. Next, the CPI pricing model. Specific to mobile applications, the cost per install is the price an advertiser pays whenever the user installs the advertised application. This pricing model allows advertisers a bit more assurance that what they're actually paying for ends up as quantifiable user engagement. Impressions of the ads are not part of the equation, rather it's the performance that actually matters. Advertisers ultimately pay for what they want to, but in doing so they kind of lose the ability to track users or generate large scale brand awareness as they do not know or understand which actual touch points actually resulted in the app being downloaded by the end user. Due to the focus on the end goal of app download, several users are not exposed to the campaign, thereby limiting reach or scale for this kind of pricing. Do keep writing in if you have any questions. The next section is viewability. And uh, back to you, Tanvi. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, if you could just move on to the next slide, we can get started with the last session, which is viewability where we'll talk about the different definitions of viewability in the market as well as benchmarks. But let's first talk about why there is a need to measure viewable impressions separately. As we covered in the first section, there are multiple steps involved in serving a video ad. Just because there is an intent to display the ad does not mean that the ad is truly viewable by the user. It might be below the page fold uh, or not on the mobile screen. It might not have loaded properly. There are multiple things that could have gone wrong. And advertisers are finally demand, demanding that they pay only for ads which were at least in front of the user and had a chance to be seen. Um, uh, Abhishek, could you move on to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, let's discuss the different definitions of viewability. It started off simple enough with the Media Rating Council trying to standardize this definition. It mandated that only video impressions were at least 50% of the pixels are on screen and have been on screen for at least two continuous seconds can be counted as viewable. But as viewability gains adoption, both advertisers and the ecosystem players are devising their own definitions based on what works for them. Another uh, definition which is popular among CPG clients is the audibility and viewability on complete definition, AVOC, which is supported by Mode which counts a video as viewable only if it is 100% in view and audible on video complete. Then there is a definition promoted by the WPP agency, which requires that the ad be user initiated 100% in view for at least 50% of the video duration with the sound on. Now, as you can see that from pure visibility of the pixels, audibility has also become a requirement from advertisers for viewability. However, there will have to be a fine balance between the user experience and this viewability definition, which includes audibility. Video ads have so far gained acceptance from users because the audio controls have been left to them. No one is scared of a video ad popping up at the wrong time when they are, you know, surreptitiously checking the news or playing a mobile game in the middle of a meeting or a class. So there will have to be a fine balance uh, which will need to be maintained between acceptance of the video ad with audio on from the user as well as the counting of viewable impressions. Integral Ad Science has been kind enough to share its H1 2016 media quality report with us which shows that video viewability stands at 32% on programmatic channels where there is not a lot of control on publisher placement and at 64% where there is a direct relationship with the publisher. Again, this is intuitive because in the second case, the advertiser or the ad network 
can work with the publisher to improve the quality of the placement. Uh, just to clarify, these are numbers across desktop and mobile both. These are not specific to mobile. In fact, uh, uh, there are not a lot of uh, mobile video viewability benchmarks available uh, easily because uh, not a lot of players have been supporting it so far. The adoption of uh, video viewability on mobile is uh, just starting out and probably by Q1 next year uh, we should have a lot of uh, metrics to share. That brings us to the end of the session. Please feel free to share your questions over the chat window and we will do our best to answer as many of them as we can in the next 10 minutes. I already have a couple of questions which have come in. Uh, what doesn't work in China? Uh, okay, so this I guess is in reference uh, to the point that I had made about the skip button. Uh, this is uh, to clarify that, uh, for example, a lot of ad networks and exchanges might have a video experience where the skip or the close button appears only after Q1 complete, which is 25% of the video has completed. And what China has just mandated in its advertising laws is that any ad that displays uh, digitally needs to have an option for a close or a skip button immediately without any delay. So delayed skip ads are probably not going to work in China. Delayed skip or non-skippable for that matter. Okay, another question that I have is how much time does it take to load a mobile video ad? Okay. Uh, this will obviously vary based on the different types of formats. Let's just assume we're talking about WAST since that's the most popular. Uh, the WAST tag is ingested and then served with the requisite uh, wrappers. The loading process actually involves unwrapping the WAST tag, fetching the appropriate media file uh, because you know the WAST tag contain, contains multiple formats of the video file and multiple aspect ratios. So uh, identifying and uh, fetching the appropriate media file then caching it locally on the device, and then finally showing it to the user. And uh, uh, so one thing that I would like to point out here is that our common error or issue that we see with loading of bar tags is multiple wrappers. Uh, it is intuitive to understand that the earlier the ad is ready, the better chance it has of being shown. This is because most publishers mediate their placement and provide a finite time limit in which to receive a ready response. And additional wrappers mean additional hops and network calls, which is costly in terms of latency. A fast domain wrapper uh, costs 500 milliseconds to up to one second, whereas a slow uh, domain wrapper or a wrapper on a slow domain may actually uh, cost more than one second. Uh, Abhishek, uh, do you want to take some questions? Sure, Tanvi. Uh, I see a question here. Uh, with iOS 10 bringing on some IDFA policy changes, how does it impact attribution? This question was by RT. Thanks, RT, for your question. Um, well, if the limit ad tracking flag is turned on, ad, ad networks will not receive the IDFA of the device that is required for matching an attribution. And this results in basically two alternatives for any ad network. The first option is that it can ignore all traffic with limit ad tra tracking turned on and the ad network will not serve ads to such traffic. And the second approach could be a combination of the IP address and the user ag agent as a proxy uh, for the device ID. And this method is called fingerprinting, which is essentially a probabilistic method of attribution. Now, ad, ad networks are either resort, resorting to the first option or the second option to minimize impact. And uh, each of them has its pros and cons. So uh, you, you'll be seeing uh, different players react differently to this, uh, to the iOS 10 uh, limit ad tracking problem. Then I have another question by Jeff. Advertisers these days have to pay on BTA2 doesn't it imply that they have to spend more money? Nice question, Jeff. Uh, well, VDA allows you to attribute users who have seen an ad but 
they downloaded the app later and with an agreed upon time frame. So uh, at Inmobi, we've seen that about 40% to 60% additional high LTV users do get attributed via or through VDA or V2 attribution. Now, once we attribute such or any ad network attributes such additional users via VTA, this allows them to go ahead and find more of such users as well by analyzing their behavior. So this actually helps in unlocking more users and more scale for your campaigns. So while it may seem you know that you do have to spend a little more money for the new installs, but that's a very short-sighted uh, view. In the long run, you're actually getting a lot more scale and your uh, conversions are going to be a lot, lot more. Then, Thanks, Abhishek. I have a couple. I have a couple of questions uh, here. Uh, I have a question from uh, Maria, who asks, "What pricing models are you using at Inmobi?" At Inmobi, we have CPM, CPC, CPI, uh, CPCV. All of these uh, pricing models. Uh, another question is, which video format renders the quickest? And I think this is uh, an important one. This is by uh, Kathy. Uh, so of all the four formats that I discussed, site served, vast, vpaid, and mrate, it is important for you to understand that in case of site served and vast, there is an op technical feasibility for the publisher or the ad network to prefetch the video asset and cache it. So that, you know, as soon as the publisher gives the render command, it will be on the screen and you'll start playing. However, on the other hand, you have MRAID and BPAID, which because of their interactive features do not, uh, uh, do not have uh, the capability to be prefetched and cached. So obviously, VAST and site served will be uh, quicker than BPAID and MRAID. Between VAST and site served, uh, which actually segues nicely into the question by Leon on can you elaborate, uh, elaborate more about site served video. Uh, so sites of video is where the publisher or the ad network has the video ad asset already, which is the MP4 file. It is not third party hosted. Whereas VAST is a third party hosted ad, but which also has the option of being prefetched. But still in unwrapping this third party hosted VAST tag, uh, you will encounter some latencies because of the wrappers involved. Now these wrappers are used for measurement and targeting purposes. Uh, even if you omit the targeting, I'm sure no advertiser wants to omit the measurement or the independent measurement which a VAST tag offers. So there will be certain latencies involved in a VAST tag which will not be there in a site served ad. In case of a site served, the advertiser literally gives us their MP4 file. We upload it onto our system and whenever uh, there is an ad, video ad to be uh, displayed and you know it fits the targeting criteria, uh, we just fetch it from our systems and without the hurdles and additional agencies of unwrapping different measurement uh, URLs, it is served. Uh, mind you, even though it is, uh, there is no independent measurement, the publisher or the ad network will be able to give you all the requisite uh, measurements that are metrics that matter to you. The number of views, plays, quartile completions, completion rates, clicks, engagements, the entire uh, uh, Jing Bang will be provided to you by the publisher or the ad network, whoever uh, is the host in this site served concept. I think uh, we have just one minute left and one last question again from Maria. Do you have an opportunity to make retargeting for users using video opportunity? Uh, I mean, match device IDs and offer ad for particular audience segments. Uh, yes, uh, there is absolutely nothing stopping uh, you from doing retargeting for uh, video ads. You might be limited in scale uh, because as I mentioned, the overall mobile video inventory itself is limited uh, in the industry right now. And so to be able to find your exact device ID and a video ad request uh, might be a question of uh, uh, probably some patience uh, more than anything. But there is absolutely nothing stopping you from uh, retargeting users uh, with video ads. 
uh, you can do it through Inmobi, the Inmobi Exchange, or through any of the other players which offer this feature. All right, so that brings us to the end of the session. Uh, thank you for your questions, and we hope that you found this uh, session useful. The next webinar that we have is scheduled for 25th of October, and it is focused primarily on uh, best practices for optimizing and maximizing the completion rate. So uh, uh, feel free to sign up for that. Uh, I'm sure it will be uh, uh, interesting, if uh, nothing else. Uh, we will try to get on board an advertiser or a third-party uh, player like Innovent so that they can also give their experience from the field. Um, we will be sending out a recording of this uh, webinar uh, probably in a couple of days. So in case you missed, missed it or missed part of it, uh, don't worry. You will have the recording with you. Thanks a lot for joining, guys. Bye-bye.